is Life in the Passing Lane, an autobiography by me. I'm Alex Bennett. You know, I thought when I did the last chapter of this autobiography, it was going to be the last chapter, because what a more exciting stuff was going to happen in my life? Not really much. And you know something? I was right. My life has been pretty damn dull. I mean, when you're not working in the radio business, and you're not meeting up with famous people, and you're not doing extraordinary things, and also you don't have the money to do it with, I mean, I have some money, but, you know, you, as you get to be older and you get to be on a fixed income and you are in your senior years. I, I Get that. I'm a senior, okay? I can call myself a senior. I just, I hit 80 years old. But uh, anyway, uh, it, as you get older, uh, you, you know, you just, you don't have as many adventures. And then all of a sudden, one day, you have a new adventure. And that's why I entitled this chapter, I've Got Cancer, Part One. Hi there, I'm cancer survivor Alex Bennett. No, I'm not yet. I'm not a cancer survivor yet. I'm about ready to go into all the treatments and things like that. And then I can come back and do that cancer uh, survivor routine on you. But for the time being, I've just got cancer. Let me tell you how this all came about, okay? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't go to doctors much. As, uh, as, as I got older, I found I was going to more and more doctors to the point where I then had them as my biggest social activity. Uh, you know, you go to the, uh, you go to the uh, uh, gastroenterologist and uh, you go to your GP and you go to your heart guy and you go to this guy and that guy because as you get older, they begin to worry about you, you know. And so at my age, they really worry about you. I mean, everything that goes wrong with you. If you've got a wart on your finger, eh, I don't know, we better take care of that. we got to make sure you don't have any bad. But, you know, if you have something else when you're like uh, 20, they just go, eh, you've just got a wart on your finger. What the hell? It's no big deal. But when you get to be my age, they worry about everything. So anyway, that being said... Let's go back a few years, all right, to the point where my prostate decided, you know, you've had enough fun with me. Now I'm going to get even for all that fun. And uh, I suddenly found that I was uh, having to go to the bathroom more and more often. Now, let me explain to guys who don't know and to women who really don't care. The prostate happens to be a gland that men have that uh, secretes, secretes, you know what you call pre-cum, that, 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 that clear liquid that comes out with, with sometimes before uh, your sperm comes out, but then it comes out sometimes with the sperm and everything. It's kind of like a, I don't know, it's a, it's a fluid that, that uh, drags the rest of it along. I don't Anyway, that's what it is, what some people call pre-cum. Uh, and uh, it secretes that, and that's its, that's its main job. And it is uh, located uh, down around the rectum and down around, well, not just down around, uh, the urethra. Let me explain. I, I hear I have to be a doctor, right? And I'm not. Uh, let me explain the urethra. The urethra is the, uh, women have them too, goes right through and uh, you, uh, uh, you pee through it. That's where your urine comes through. It goes from your bladder through the urethra out your vagina or penis or wherever you're, you're, you excrete urine, all right? Only on men, before it gets out, it goes through the prostate because the pros prostate is kind of like donut. It's about the size of a walnut, and it's like a donut, and the urethra goes right through it, all right? So that as men get older, their prostate has a tendency to enlarge, and as it enlarges, it starts squeezing down on the urethra, and that's why you see old men going to the bathroom every five minutes. Like, I, I first got it really bad when I was, uh, when I was uh, oh, I don't know, hitting about 73, 70, excuse me, not 73, 74, 63, 64, somewhere around there, all right? I started to, you know, just having pee more and more often, and I'd be doing the show over at Sirius XM, and my God, all of a sudden, I'm like uh, 
running off to the bathroom with great urgency. I mean, I would feel this twinge down there, and I would go, I have to go pee right now. i got to do it now. Ooh, 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 I'm hopping up and down. And so we would play like a record or something while I ran off and, and peed. And this was getting to be annoying because I couldn't do a full show without that. So somebody suggested, you better go to a urologist. Sounds like you've got an enlarged prostate. So uh, the only time I had ever gone to a urologist before was in San Francisco years earlier, and that's because I think I had the clap or something. I can't remember what the reason was, but I was having some problems uh, with with the tubing, as it were, and I was very young at the time. And he was a great guy. He was a nice guy. God, he was a great guy. He was the head of urology at St. Francis Hospital, and um, he, uh, you know, he would do the, uh, the there's, a, there's a thing we call, they call the gold standard in, in uh, checking out your prostate, and that's sticking a finger up your ass uh, <clears throat> without the reach around, as they say, without the niceties of a reach around. Uh, it, it, they stick a finger up your ass, and they go in there and they feel around because they want to see if there are any lumps or anything on the prostate. And it's it's slightly uncomfortable, but uh, you know you get after about the fifth time or so, you get pretty used to it. Uh, but anyway, I went to this doctor, and he was a urologist, and a really nice guy. And he um, he stuck his finger up my ass, and then when he's through, he said, "You know, I, I got a problem." He says, "These damn short fingers." And I'm thinking to myself, you you know, if you go into urology, maybe if you've got short fingers, you should think maybe about some other specialty besides urology because you got to stick your finger up there and feel those things and if it's too short to get to them uh you're, you're, you're well anyway nice guy i liked him that was it that's the only urologist i ever saw but now all of a sudden i'm getting to be an old guy older guy i'm here i am 65 and peeing like uh going to the bathroom every five minutes when i go to the bathroom i pee a little bit and then i go back and i'm feeling relieved for another 20 minutes and i gotta go again and any guy who's ever had this knows that it's it's not fun because you're always trying to consider where the closest bathroom is. In other words, if you say, I'm, I'm going downtown, I'm going down to Best Buy, you know that at Best Buy they have a bathroom you can use if you need it. And then you can buy whatever you have and run home and hope you don't have the urgency to pee till you get home and take a pee here. But then in between, you you should know, you know, you have them all, you have every free bathroom worked out. They've got a free bathroom at the Apple store. They, you know, you've got a map in your mind of bathrooms you can hit. Uh, it was also at that time that I got a little pissed at the fact that some places go, oh, I'm sorry, you're not a customer, you can't use our bathroom. I said, okay, well, then I'll pee my pants right here in front of all your customers, you know. But anyway, it gets that bad. You know, so I figured I got to do something about this. I got to go. I got to go see a urologist. So I can't remember. I had a doctor at the time. It wasn't a very good doctor. And I said, I need to go see a urologist. And they say, well, here's the urologist to go see. So I go to see this guy. And first of all, the thing that, that always amazed me about urology offices is you look around and there's not a young guy there. Okay. I, you know, I, 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 you just, there isn't a young guy. That's it, plain and simple. It's just old guys sitting there and, and some old women too, because women do get urinary problems, but they don't get them quite the same way guys do. Urologists basically, I think, de- deal more with a male clientele than a female clientele, although I may be wrong. And this guy, um, it's really weird. You know, it was like he was always fishing for stuff to do. And this is the guy who decided that I needed a, um, what they call a cystoscopy. Now, they have all these oscopies, all right? Uh, colonoscopy goes up your ass, looks at your colon. Uh, a, uh, get, uh, what do they call it? A uh, There's one that goes through the throat. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. They shove a, a telescope down your throat and look at your area down there. Your, you know, your your esophagus and so on. Uh, the, the one I told you goes to the colon, and then they got this little thing called cystoscopies. Little, uh, it's a it's a thing where they, they guys. Well, let me warn you: if you're squeamish about what people do with penises, uh, just kind of like go. 
up about a minute and get out of this area because I'm going to say something that's going to make you feel very uncomfortable if you don't know about it already. A cystoscopy is when they stick this tube up your penis to look at your bladder. And you would think, okay, okay, it's a little, probably a little like a fiber optic little thing. And they just put it in there and they look. No. You go in there, you're lying there getting ready, and they finally unveil it because it's sitting on a table with a cloth over it so you don't see it. And it's like a fucking boa constrictor. It's huge. You know, I say, do you have anything a bit larger? Because I'm going to need it. Uh, no, but I mean, and, and it, it, they then put some uh, uh, numbing agent in your penis. Oh, boy. I really shouldn't even talk. Anyway, what happens is they go up the penis. They go take a look at your bladder. Uh, my line to him was, unless you find gold in there, I'd get out pretty soon. And it took him about two minutes. And that was it. And then I went home, and I came down with a fever, and I had an infection, and they had to give me antibiotics because somehow his boa constrictor wasn't sterilized enough. All right? But for some reason, I'm an asshole, and I keep going to this doctor. And uh, every time he says, well, you know, uh, we, we one case, he, he took some kind of test, and he saw something, he saw something really strange. And anytime there was blood in my urine, and there was always blood in my urine. I don't know why, always blood in my urine. Most of the future urologists that I would tell this to, and I said it was always the case, they go, oh, okay, we understand. Because some people, some men have that. But he would always send it out to be biopsied and looked at and tested and so on. One time he said, it looks like you have a, something strange in there came back. And I'm going, I've had it with this guy. But that wasn't until he got around to a second cystoscopy with me. Yeah, he got, he got a second one out of me. Yeah, yeah. And I, this guy just completely put me off on urologist. And I said, I don't care if I've got something wrong with my urine. I'm not going back there. Okay, I got better things to do than go to this guy. So that that's another urologist I'm unhappy with. So then I don't go to a urologist for a while. I've got the uh, they gave me pills uh, for the uh, for the enlarged prostate uh, called finasteride that shrinks it. Okay, over time to take care of it immediately. They give you Flomax for today. They give you actually give you Cialis daily Cialis, which does the same thing Flomax does. And it gives you a boner as well. But they, I did get those prescriptions, and so I managed to just keep getting the stuff. I went to my my uh, GP, and I said, by the way, I've run out of uh, finasteride. He said, okay, here's a prescri for, prescription for that. He said, no Flomax. He gave me a prescription for that. And we were good to go. You know, And I just never, I, for a while, I didn't go back to a urologist. And then I got to feel guilty about it, right? Because I'm getting to that age where, hey, it should be checked out and so on. So I asked my doctor, do you know anybody? And he says, oh, there's some people over at uh, Mount Sinai. I'll get you a name. He got me a name. I went and saw the guy. And this guy, this urologist, I couldn't stand either. Why? Because he just didn't care about urology. He cared more about having a social party with the nurses and all the staff around him and playing like the big poo boss sitting on his throne as they would come in and, gen and genuflect to him. Uh, and uh, that I didn't like, so I, that was the last time I went to that, that egotistical maniac. Anyway, you're getting the picture that I, I just I've found a series of, of, of uh, urologists who I don't like. And then one time, I, so, so finally I go to my doctor, and I'm, I'm, uh, well, I can't remember what the problem was, but I need to go do something. And I, oh, I know what it was. Uh, he, every year, would give me a PSA test. Now, let me explain the PSA test to you, in case I haven't done so. PSA test is this test they do where they check for a prostate-specific antigen. And this is something, that if it rises, it is an indication that you might have prostate cancer. So as long as it's low, it's fine. And I was getting, like, 0.9s, 1.1s, 1.2s, whatever, you know, not not serious at all, nothing you would even pay attention to. All of a sudden, one comes in, and it says 2.5. So I call my doctor, and I said, that's not good. And he said, well, it's not bad, you know, because he's not a urologist. 
And I said, I think I should go to a urologist about this just to let him see. And he said, okay, fine, I'll give you a name. And he gave me the name of this doctor he knew. So I go to him. Now, this guy is, if, if the other two guys, or the first guy was kind of weird because he was just, you know, padding the buck by giving me too many cystoscopies. And if the second one turned me off because he was too casual and holding parties in his office, um, uh, the third one uh, was weird in his own way. A really nice guy, you know, very decent to you very calming in a lot of ways. But I should have known his office was filthy, okay? It was just a filthy office. And uh, he didn't seem to have a nurse. You know how most doctors have a nurse, at least one nurse who prepares you or gives you a shot or does something or he collects a urine sample or whatever. Nothing like that. Just some woman at the front desk taking your money. And also he, he had, would only take cash. But anyway, barring that, okay, I mean, that and, and uh, uh, he would take insurance, however, you know. But barring that, uh, he, uh, he, never, he never stuck his finger up my ass, which I always was told was the gold standard in checking for prostate cancer. And he never did that, never. Uh, uh, until later on when I finally asked him if he would because I think he just found it ucky, yucky, okay? So anyway, um, um, uh, this guy uh, is uh, checking me out and he goes, well, okay, I don't, I don't feel anything. Uh, and he, had a, he did a, a, what do you call it, a sonogram on me. He says, I don't see anything. He had even a sonogram probe. He stuck, stuck up my ass. I, I don't see anything. He said, uh, go get a, a, a blood test, uh, you know, six months from now. And I had like I'd gotten up to something like a two point eight, and I came back to him six months later. And I said, "It's a it's a, it's a, it's a two point five, down from a two point five. It was a two point eight or something like that, and it went down to a two point five. And I said, it's "Down to a two point five. He says, "Okay, well, come back and see me in another six months, and take a go go down and get a blood test." So I go down and get another blood test. Now it goes up to four three. He says, I think you better get another blood test in in six months. And I go in another six months, and it's gone up to like a, a, a five-something. Well, finally, it got all the way up, after we kept doing these every six months, up to a 6.7. And he said, I think we better do a biopsy. Now, that's a dreaded word, because what they got to do is go down there and uh, literally stick needles in your in your prostate and um, isn't all this, I, I don't know why I'm even doing this, because this is so unlistenable, because of all the things I'm describing. But anyway, they, they take this, uh, the, the, these needles, and they uh, puncture into your prostate, and they get uh, samples. And they send it off to a lab, and the lab says, is it cancer, is it not cancer? And if it is cancer, how much is it cancer? And that how much is in something called the Gleason score? I'll let you make your own jokes right now while I wait. Gleason score. <laughs> How sweet it is. Anyway. So uh, I, I don't know whether I want to do this. I, I don't know if he isn't, if this isn't overkill. So I talked to my, my GP, and he says, yeah, it sounds a little bit like overkill to me. I said, do you have a better doctor for me, better urologist? He says, well, you know, they're all, he said to me, I said, I never can find a good urologist because they all seem weird. And he says, they are all weird. Even in the medical profession, they look upon urologists as the weird group, all right? So he says, uh, here, here's, here's another doctor I can send you to. He's pretty good. He's, he's very methodical. And I call him up, and I go to see this doctor, and he goes, he sees all my stuff and all the work. And he says, well, let's wait three months. Let's then do a blood test. Then uh, let's see uh, what, what, what comes back, Okay. So he's very cautious about this. And we, I come back three months later, and I do the blood test. And it comes back, and actually my 6.7 went down to a 4.3. That's almost a, what, a third down, okay? That's almost 33% less than it was. So that's a good sign, he said. But there's a problem. I did a 4K, had him do a 4K test. And this is a test they do where they do some extra stuff. And he said, there's a... 50, 46% chance you've got a Gleason 7. 
Now, at Gleason 6, yeah, you've got cancer, but they just say, well, wait and watch. When you get a Gleason 7, they say, maybe we got to do something about this. So he it comes back, and it's a Gleason 7. How sweet it isn't. And um, he, uh, he said, uh, I think you better go see uh, a, uh, uh, what do you call it, an uh, uh, um, oncologist. Now, let me tell you for a moment what oncologists are. Oncologists are guys who deal with cancer, okay? They're cancer doctors. And it doesn't mean that they can't cure you. It doesn't mean that, you know, you, you're, you're going to die. It just, you know, it just means that this is the doctor whose specialty it is to deal with cancer and how to, how to, how to deal with it. And uh, he sends me to this doctor here in New York, who uh, is a, has a certain specialty. His specialty is prostate seeds. Uh, I'll explain that to you. All this has to be explained to you so that you know what we're dealing with here. Uh, the prostate seed procedure is they actually take little rice-sized isot- uh, 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 grains of, of, of isotopes and stick them in your prostate and where it sits and radiates for about two months and hopefully kills all the prostate cancer that's there. But he said, uh, so this was his specialty, and it was so much his specialty that 20 years ago he became famous because he was the doctor who implanted prostate seeds in Rudy Giuliani, who unfortunately we know to this day is still alive and making our lives a living hell, but I'm not going to hold that against my doctor. And uh, he came up with processes that advanced the way in which the seeds were done and made them uh, less of a problem to people when they did it. And it was, he, he is the go-to guy on this kind of thing. But it is his specialty, you know. So does he like other kinds of radiation? Well, I go to see him, and he says, well, from what I see, here's what we're going to do. He says, first, you're going to get what we call stereotactic. Uh, radiation, which it goes by a brand name in other places of cyber knife, but it's no different than what we're going to do to you. Okay, he said uh, uh, we're going to basically do the cyber knife on you. He said it used to be that you used to have to go to a doctor, you used to have to go get radiation five days a week for two months to cure this. Now this, the cyber knife, it's like five minutes of forty-five minutes each. That's it. You're in, you're out, and you don't need any more of that radiation. He said, and then we're going to do the seeds. And I said, why are we going to do the seeds? He says, to make sure that we catch everything. Okay. He said, so we'll do the seeds. Uh, and we'll do that a couple of weeks after you're through with uh, this other thing. And uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, that's pretty much uh, uh, where, where it stood. Now, there's more to this adventure, and there's more to come, because I still have to start my radiation. So by the time I do the next episode, I will have probably gone through a lot of the radiation. But I'll tell you what led up to that, and how it led up to that, and uh, where it's going. And uh, you'll follow my little adventure here, as uh, we next time we look at, well, (laughs) I've got cancer, too. This has been Life in the Passing Lane, an audio biography by me. I'm Alex Bennett.